I welcome everyone to today's interesting program about Boston and Belfast. I'm honored to have Martin Nangle here with us today. But before we start, I just want to let you know that I'm muting you all um, as you come in. But if there are any questions for our speaker, you have the ability to unmute yourself at the end. Um, or you can put them in the chat box and I will pose them to him at the end. And also we are filming this talk for Milton Access Cable. And I want to thank the friends of the Milton Public Library for their support of my programs. Now, let me tell you more about Mr. Nangle. He is an Irish photojournalist who will share images from his most recent books with us. The new books are called Circle, Volume 1, A Belfast Story, and its sister book, which is called September 89 which is about Boston neighborhoods. These large format titles are from his documentary photographic archives and are now in the permanent collection of the Ulster Museum. Although the photos are curated from these renowned collections, they also describe in text what it was like to be a photojournalist working for the national and international media during the 1970s and 1980s in both Belfast and Boston. I'll let him tell you more, but please join me in a warm welcome for Martin. Hello, everyone. Um, first of all, thanks very much, Jean, for uh, setting this up. And uh, yeah, uh, we will um, endeavor to get some information um, about how these uh, two archives were brought together uh, as a book, or, well, as a volume, and creating two books. So um, the books cover um, the period uh, of the 1970s and the 1980s. Uh, and the first book was made in Belfast during the 80s and the, the 90s. Uh, and it was, uh, they were made to a back, backdrop of uh, civil conflict in Belfast. So I just want to um, uh, introduce you to um, basically, how the photography was used in the books. Um, I was using, uh, with both books, they incorporate uh, three styles of photography, uh, photojournalism, street photography, and documentary photography. Now, there's a, a subtle difference, really, a uh, very, very subtle difference between uh, these three styles. For instance, uh, documentary photography is usually... Um, uh, about big projects, uh, projects that are planned um, and that um, uh, cover a narrative uh, over a period of time. So the documentary that relates to the Belfast story is about the redevelopment of a city, an old city, an old Victorian industrial city uh, that needed to be redeveloped. The housing stock was crumbling. Um, the city was um, looking old and industrialized. And um, it was, um, my documentary was uh, planned over uh, two decades. Street photography is uh, more about the immediate. So you get a lot of people, uh, a lot of photographers who will go on the street uh, and they'll take instant photographs and they'll focus on people mostly, people in streets. And they will, um, they usually are, are, are using what we call street photography. Photojournalism um, is just slightly different insofar as it covers events as well, but it also is used to um, make documentaries. And uh, the relevance of these will become clear as we move um, uh, through the, um, the talk. So <clears throat> this is the result uh, of the, uh, the two projects, these books. And um, as you can see, I've said that it's a fusion of closely related photographic styles, photojournalism, street and documentary photography. So um, I just want to um, uh, say a little bit about myself. And um, I uh, grew up in uh, County Armagh in uh, Northern Ireland. And then the, the, the trouble started when I was a young man and I went to uh, art college. and. In art college, um, I, I, I specialized in photography. And in completing the course, um, we were mostly, mostly influenced in this kind of work, kind of work, documentary photography and photojournalism by the American um, uh, movement 
of the uh, 40s, the 50s, and the 60s. And he, here are some of the people, uh, the American, great American photographers that influenced me as a photographer when I was at art college. Uh, Rob, you, you may know them, um, I've heard of them. Robert Frank, uh, very, very famous guy, made a book called The Americans. Uh, Dorothy Lang, uh, Eugene Smith, uh, also big in Philadelphia, Leonard Freed, all over uh, America. And so these people, um, we studied them or I studied them and I used um, uh, their experiences to cultivate um, a, a, a style. And that style was the era of black and white photography that existed at that time. And so uh, when I was at art college, um, around the, the college was a zone, an area, a neighborhood that was being completely demolished and a community was just being uprooted and sent to other parts of the city or even outside of the city. And so I used the area around the art college to um, uh, cut my teeth, to learn my the, the trade, uh, living in the era of black and white, uh, focusing on portraiture, uh, portraiture against um, uh, you know, the places where they lived and the streets they lived. And I would describe this kind of photography as a mix of uh, document, early documentary in, in my terms uh, about myself and street photography. Now, when I was at college, um, and th these are just some of the other pictures, but when I was at college, two things were happening um, around the college. Uh, I think yeah, in this picture, the corner of Academy Street, I think of the, the one of the shop, just at the very end of the street, you can see the college. And <clears throat> two things were happening. The troubles, the Irish troubles were beginning to uh, really, really uh, become seriously uh, evolved. And um, there was a lot of uh, 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 bombings and trouble going on around the city centre. And the second thing was that the, the, the city planners had implemented um, a redevelopment program and the neighborhood around the college was, as I said earlier, was going to be demolished. And so I started to concentrate on photographing this area before it was uh, completely destroyed. And I was moving around and I could see the, 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 um, I could see the emphasis that the Americans have put on black and white, because as I was looking at this city, this Belfast of 1974, I just saw a black and white city. Uh, I mean, the, this uh, little part of the T.S. Eliot's, the wasteland from 1922, um, it, it just summed it up. Uh, the area was turning, and uh, the whole city centre was turning into a wasteland. And so, um, the art college uh, was a, a kind of an interesting period insofar as um, not many people who go to art college do so in the middle of a, of a, a bombing campaign or, a, or, a, or, a, or a, 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 what we call it a troubled um, civil disturbance, um, which was fueled by uh, politics and economics and history, of course. So, after I left um, uh, college, I took my first job uh, in uh, a, ho uh, a hospital called the Royal Victoria Hospital. I took a job as a medical photographer. And the reason I went to the hospital was because this hospital was placed in the middle of West Belfast. And this is the view of West Belfast from the hospital, from uh, the level nine. It was just a, a single uh, tar block. Uh, an outpatient's tar block uh, in the area, and it overlooked what was basically the the um, the the stronghold, the core of the IRA uprising, and if you want to call it that, uh, in Belfast. And this area uh, was where I wanted to um, go around at night time and try to build up a um, a, a portfolio. And the reason I needed the portfolio was uh, because I wanted to uh, begin a career in media. So 
the art, uh, the the, um, the 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 Royal Victoria Hospital, uh, where I was a medical photographer, um, there was a little bit of concern about me taking pictures out of this window. By the way, because the staff were very worried. They assumed that the security forces were coming into our department uh, after work, after we left, and using it to um, uh, convey surveillance over the area as part of their um, uh, counter um, uh, terrorism uh, operations or whatever you want to call them. And there's a good reason for that because this is the same view. This is the same view from the same window uh, during the day when there was lots of trouble and rioting going on. And um, yeah, I mean, I had no evidence that they were using it for surveillance, but I mean, it was an interesting story, but I managed to uh, ignore them and take some pictures. So at night time, I would leave my uh, job and I would walk around the area, um, which was close to the, um, uh, the, the hospital and close to the peace lines as well, trying to build up a little portfolio of street photography, which was a kind of uh, uh, backing up my long-term documentary project of trying to uh, document uh, Belfast over a long period of time uh, at the, uh, with the backdrop to redevelopment and the troubles that were going on at the time. And so um, I um, just want to see where I am here. Yeah, I was moving around late at night um, simply because uh, during the day, there were too many people on the street and there was a, still a little bit of nervousness about a guy with a camera. You have to realise that you know, there were no telephones in those days, no telephone cameras. People with cameras stood out. And when they stood out, they were asked, where are you from? Who do you work with? And who are you? And I had no answers to these questions. So I would go out when I assumed everyone was at home around about six o'clock having what we called their tea uh, at that time. And so um, I was able to, to, to go in empty streets just looking for examples um, of uh, what I would basically refer to as street photography. But I was being nervous. You can see over here I've written, I was very nervous about the situation because I was worried about people asking me who I was and where I was from. Um, and so, <clears throat> I carried on doing this uh, work at night. Um, I was actually uh, borrowing the cameras from um, uh, the, the department and then uh, bringing them back very early in the morning to put them into the safe. I mean, the staff all knew what I was doing, but they didn't care. They were turning a blind eye to it. So it got to the uh, around about 1970, um, around about 1977, an opportunity came um, after I'd put together uh, a small portfolio uh, of these streets, uh, an agency uh, popped up and I applied for the job uh, as a press photographer um, because I knew that there was no way that I could complete this project without the protection of being a member of the, international, the national and international media. So um, I was uh, uh, in, in that situation, but it paid off. The portfolio that I put together walking around uh, West Belfast uh, during those dangerous times, I just got enough uh, images to uh, join a, a, an agency called Pacemaker Photo Agency, which turned out to be the main representative for um, the national newspapers in, the, in London, the national newspapers in Dublin, and we worked for the Americans and the Germans. Uh, the Americans was mainly through uh, Newsweek and Time magazine and Reuters and the Associated Press. And I later joined the Associated Press as, a, as, as one of their photographers in later, uh, later uh, times. So the thing about working for a, a, a press agency is you've now got two jobs, or I had now two jobs. I had the, the daily job of uh, working with my clients, and my clients were obviously the IRA, uh, who were uh, uh, working uh, themselves daily, uh, fighting with the uh, British authorities. So one day I'd be working with the 
the IRA, the PIRA, or other uh, paramilitary groups. Another day I'd be working with the army or the police. Uh, uh, and this is photojournalism. And this is where the photojournalism aspect of the three styles comes in, because this allowed me to go to events. And uh, with going to events, I was also keep, keeping my eye open uh, for street photography and documentary photography. And the nice thing about the um, uh, 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 having the privileges that go with the press was it took away the fear. It took away the fear of anyone asking, uh, who are you? Who am I? I'm the world's press. Who are you? And, you know, this really, really uh, gave me confidence. It gave me, um, how would you say, status. It gave me privilege. And it ended up that our agency basically became the mouth, uh, well, no, I wouldn't say the mouth, but it became the window of opportunity for all the, the protagonists and the uh, belligerents to use us to put out their propaganda material and to put out their um, uh, uh, PR, uh, uh, public relations exercises. So we got very, very close to all these uh, belligerents uh, in uh, paramilitaries, uh, both on both sides, whether it be the Republicans, the Irish nationalists, or the British uh, loyalists, uh, on, on, on the other hand, and of course the army and the uh, police, who were very well organised, of course, and represented the establishment. So uh, during that time, uh, during the late 70s and the early 80s, I would find myself uh, in situations like this, where in the morning time I'd be working with the um, uh, uh, an IRA on patrol, uh, putting out their uh, propaganda about a, a new weapon that they had or, or the fact that they controlled certain streets. In this particular picture that you see of uh, this, what they call SEU, active service unit, walking down an alleyway, uh, they had sealed off the whole of, or not the whole, but uh, uh, several streets uh, in West Belfast just for me to take this picture uh, safely. And then in the afternoon, I would be going to meet the prime minister at the time, Margaret Thatcher. Now, the guy at the back of this picture with the moustache and the head, hollow, uh, head full of hair is me. That's me in my early days uh, as, a, as a press photographer. Um, I've changed a bit, I know, but then that's the nature of the beast. So, um, so during um, uh, the, the, the photojournalism days, I was able to gather up uh, 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 the different styles of photography. So again, on the left of the screen, you see a burning bus. And that burning bus was an event. You get a call, there's a bus burning up in the Donegal Road, go up and photograph it. But because these children on the left, they see burning buses every day. And for them, it's no big deal. But a guy with a camera, that's a big deal. And they were rushing over, take my picture, mister, you know? And to them, that was that made their day, not the burning bus, that, that just old hat, you know. And so therefore, I was able to marry the photojournalism in this picture with the documentary uh, uh, image of the young children who were able to turn their back on an event simply because they were more interested in getting their picture taken. And the same with the picture on the right. Um, I came up to uh, have a look at this redevelopment area. And this young lad just runs over. He's living in a really, really rundown area. Um, all these houses are, are, all the people are being moved out. Some of them remaining while they find them places to go. And he runs over, uh, completely oblivious, oblivious to his surroundings. And is, please, Mister, take my picture. And the nice thing about this, this picture got published uh, in the national media. And lo and behold, his mum called me at home and said. Oh, that's our aim, and can I have a picture? And I thought this is all worthwhile. You know, at least I can get, uh, give a, a little uh, something back to the the kids, or the, to the subjects that are coming out to pose. And I thought that was a, a nice touch. And also with the um, uh, the uh, ability to uh, move around the city uninhibited um, and with um, the credibility of having all the national institutions behind me, I was able to move between uh, unionist uh, parts of the city here on the, the left again, you have the what 
a road called the Shankill Road. I don't know if you've heard of it, but it's a very famous Belfast road that uh, was in conflict with, on the right-hand side of the road, the Falls Road, which is the um, Irish Nationalist Road. And these were the two main uh, communities that were uh, fighting each other at that time. Um, uh, and so I was able to uh, go to these events. And again, uh, you can see that one is documentary um, and the other is photojournalism that also moves into a kind of a documentary phase as well as a part of a long-term uh, record. And so um, that more or less, uh, these are all extracts, by the way, from the, the, the two books. The two books contain about 80 pictures and each book, 160 images. So we can't go through them all. So I just want to um, bring you to the end of the, the Belfast um, archive with this picture. Oh, sorry, I missed this one. Uh, this again um, is about moving from uh, uh, place to place. Again, on the, the left is a, a celebration of um, the, 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 the Queen, Queen Elizabeth Jubilee in 1977. And here you have a very happy uh, street party going on, all waving their, their Union flags. And on the right is a St. Patrick's Day parade around about the same time, which was totally focused on um, political issues. And in this particular political issue, it was events leading up to uh, the, uh, the, the Republican prisoners' hunger strikes that took place a few years later. And it's interesting that, um, you know, both areas, again, what they saw was important. Um, the British area, the Unionist area, wanted to celebrate uh, something like the Silver Jubilee and make sure that it represented them. And on the Falls Road, um, the focus was on the political struggles of the um, the uh, uh, PRI uh, IRA prisoners uh, and their hunger strike for political status. So. That was what I was doing as part of the media, using photojournalism and using the photojournalism to come together with the documentary photography, which was the long term overview of the city in its redevelopment uh, during the, 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 that period. And so with this final picture from the, um, this, uh, the Belfast book, is what I call the Alpha and the Omega. And there's a, a, a nice story about this I just want to um, talk about. The picture on the left of the two old codgers um, was taken when I was at our college. And I would get the, the, the train into Belfast and then go from the train. It was about a 10 minute walk round to the art college. And as I was passing through this area, an old market called Smithfield, Smithfield I saw these two guys, obviously, um, you know, a little despondent, the picture of hopelessness. Um, and I thought these guys could be the start of my uh, documentary archive that I'm trying to do. But the, the reality was I had no camera. I didn't own a camera, I owned nothing. And so I thought to myself, oh my God, here we are. I'm looking at a picture and I can't take it. So I rushed away around, I run like hell, right to the art college, rushed up into the department. I signed out a camera. I run back round to the market and lo and behold, the two guys were still there. And so I took the picture and I thought, my very first picture. Then 30 years later, in 19, 30 years later, sorry, uh, 74, 15 years later, the, after the, the, the market had been uh, burnt down and uh, gone through a little bit of lawlessness, um, it was rebuilt again. And it opened in 1989, and I went down to cover uh, the opening, and these two ladies were standing outside, and what they were talking about was they had heard that there may be a ceasefire coming, uh, and that the troubles might, it might have been the, um, uh, the beginning of the end, so to speak, uh, or, the, or uh, and, and the start of something new. And whenever I took this picture of the new Smithfield, in 1989, I knew that the project had come to an end and that I had to start something new. So I put it all together and um, I, I, I made a, a, an exhibition for Belfast and we called the exhibition 
Belfast only, all other places. And if you look at this post box, you'll see that there are plates uh, on the post box that are very, very thin. And they're meant to, um, and they were there, they were put there to stop letter bombs uh, being posted to civilians from one belligerent uh, group to another. And so when I looked at it, I thought, this is the picture that will describe uh, the project Belfast only all, all other places and I put it on in Belfast and then Boston heard about it the Boston Centre for the Arts and they took it over to Tremont Street in Boston and while the exhibition was being shown there um, I was there for three weeks I decided I've heard so much about Boston and the Irishness that goes on there. And I mean, we all knew about it, but I wanted to see it for myself. So I thought, yeah, I'm going to go to South, Bel or South Boston and see what I can see. I had no idea what I was looking for. I just wanted to go. But I took off and the very first images that I saw when I crossed the river I went into um, uh, uh, South Boston were murals about uh, Ireland. And this is a, uh, I think they're all gone now, but the, the first one was written in Gaelic as well, Welcome to South Boston. And I thought to myself, oh my God, it just looks so much like, you know, the parts of Belfast that I was photographing. And it also has that same atmosphere that uh, in the era of the black and white and, you know, thinking back to the American photographers who were, were saying they were using black and white as a as a way to emphasize certain aspects of, well, how would you put it, um, uh, strong imagery. And so um, when I looked at uh, these um, uh, murals, I was getting flashbacks to Belfast where also murals are also part of uh, the um, the culture. This one actually happens to be a British one uh, in an old part of uh, the city that was later redeveloped. And so <clears throat> I continued uh, around South Boston, having that in mind about the similarities, you know, between the Irishness in South, Belf uh, South Boston and also in Belfast. And this one in particular, I thought was very interesting because this is Patterson Way. I don't know if you know South Boston, but Patterson Way is right in the very heart of South uh, Boston. And this mural is uh, saluting uh, the IRA, but it's also saluting exactly the same event that this uh, mural on the right side of the uh, screen is showing you, where it is saluting an IRA unit that uh, 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 were killed, the volunteers that were killed in, in the troubles uh, at the same time. And I was looking at this and thinking, oh my God, it, they could be in the same city. And so, excuse me. And so I was um, thinking with that in mind, um, I carried on uh, through the uh, city, but I was kind of running out of time and, um, <clears throat> Um, let me just uh, get where I am here. Yeah, I was focusing on portraitures uh, also and uh, thinking back to Belfast where um, one of the things about working with uh, photojournalism, documentary photography, um, or what I was uh, doing was focusing on women and children who were mostly bear the brunt of uh, uh, the worst part of conflict um, um, uh, throughout the world, not only in, in, in Ireland, but in all conflicts, uh, they uh, seem to, um, you know, uh, 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 get a, a disproportionate amount of um, hardship. And so the portraits are very uh, important, uh, focusing on the women, children, and also uh, 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 adults as well, men. And throughout the, the, the journeys um, through South Boston and also in Charlestown, which was the other Irish area that I wanted to cover. I was thinking about portraits as well, about people. Uh, I love the uh, the young girl, you know, with the uh, the shamrock and the Southie. I didn't, I'd never heard of the word Southie until I uh, went to Boston, and then up in Charlestown, uh, this old guy with tarny. I had no idea what a tarny was um, until I, I did some research. And uh, it, it, they really do have very, very strong 
lineage, uh, lineage, lineage uh, with their own heritage and lineage that goes right back to the Irish uh, uh, um, settlements uh, in those two areas. So after I um, um, uh, um, I spent a few days in South Boston, I thought I better move on. But I had to cross town uh, to get to Charlestown. And in crossing town, um, I found it also very, very interesting. Um, this is leaving uh, South Boston to go to the downtown area, passing over Congress Street, past the Boston Tea Party, uh, and some of the um, uh, institutions that uh, are still in place that I noticed. But um, yeah, um, uh, very, very uh, uh, interesting areas. Um, and even though I was living in, in, in Tremont Street, I was also getting invites to um, uh, some social uh, events there. Um, I was going out uh, for picnics out in the lawn with um, people passing through the back bay. I was seeing some interesting um, houses as well. And uh, it, it, it really was um, uh, very interesting. I even had time to go to uh, see my very, very first um well, sorry, I've missed one here. Um, I've stopped at the Blue Diner as well for a, a hamburger one night, but I also um, went to see my very first baseball game, um, uh, which um, interesting people, I know this is it, the baseball game at Fenway Park. And it was my very first um, baseball game uh, where the Red Sox were playing the New York Giants. And I went with a friend of mine um, who had also brought me over a, a journalist who worked with the um, with the uh, Boston Globe, uh, Kevin Cullen, who has done uh, good work with um, uh, reporting on Ireland, and also um, um, has done a lot of work about Boston as well. And so um, after uh, crossing town and, as I say, meeting some interesting people along the way, I, I love this picture of the pumpkin pumpkin lady. Um, and uh, I, I, I got to Charlestown. And so I, I didn't know really my way about. And so I, I, I discovered the Freedom Trail and I thought, where does the Freedom Trail lead? Oh, it leads to Bunker Hill. Well, I'm trying to get to Bunker Hill. So it'll take me through Charlestown. And on my way, I will uh, look out for this Irishness again. And um, so, I uh, made my way up there and I got to Bunker Hill, sorry, going backwards, going forward, passing through uh, some lovely streets that I'd never really seen this, um, the lovely facing, the wooden face, uh, 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 the, all, all, all the wooden houses, um, the nice close, close streets. But what I noticed was when I going through Charlestown, how relaxed the place was, and how friendly people were, and how easy a time I was getting, um, you know, making these pictures in South Boston and Charlestown. And I think it was simply because the photojournalism aspect was not there. There, was no, there were no events going on in South uh, Boston and Charlestown. It was all about street photography. And the street photography means you just, you take what you see, um, nothing's really planned. And so I was making my way uh, through the streets of um, uh, Charlestown and I came across this guy who was smiling at me out, uh, out of a window wearing an Ireland um, uh, shirt. And we got talking and I said to him, um, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm just here. I have an exhibition in town and I'm just walking around making pictures. He says, oh, great. He says, well, would you like a picture of an American flag? And I thought, yeah, yeah, I don't have a picture of an American flag yet. So um, I went round to his uh, garden and I came across this, which was a what I thought was a lovely picture of the American flag flying over Charlestown and the Boston skyline. And, um, I, and that basically was the last picture or one of the last pictures that I got on my walk around um, uh, Charlestown and uh, 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 South Boston. And so 
the archives lay followed me around the world for 30 years. Um, nothing was done with them. Um, and then recently I thought, well, you know, I'm not like that guy in the picture with Maggie Thatcher anymore. You know, I don't have the head of hair. I don't have the moustache. I better do something with these pictures. And so I made the two books. And the books uh, came to be Circle Volume 1 about Belfast and about Boston. And the two were so, it was so easy to put them together because they really were marrying each other. They were reflecting each other. They were, they were talking to each other. And they did have connections. And so... When I brought out the books, uh, Boston College uh, 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 Irish Studies, the uh, the lecturers there said, "Look, would you come over to Boston and give a, a talk to our our students?" And I said, uh, "No, nah, no way, no way, no way." And he says, "Yeah, of course, of course, of course, yeah." And they paid my way over, and I went in, and um, uh, my partner came with me, and we extended the visit. And I thought, look, I'm not going to go to Boston without seeing uh, the South Coast because I'd heard about Irish people moving into the South Coast. And it was 30 years later. And I thought to myself, you know, I, 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 I just want to go there. I want to have a look at Cape Cod and so forth. And so we took a little a few days and I thought, well, I want to start a new archive uh, from that area because you know, the memory shed a light, as I say here, on the past and inform the future. But time moves on. It was a different time, you know. Uh, today's a different time. No more negatives. I didn't see the world as a black and white world anymore, you know. It was more colour. Um, there was a different narrative. It was more about diversity. And so when we went down to the, the South Coast, uh, well, I went to Boston first, and um, I thought to myself, what will be the difference in this was a difference. O'Leary's Pub in Dorchester uh, Street, Boston, 1989. You know, it almost looks like something out of the, a set from the West, um, you know, an old saloon. And then this modern little uh, uh, ticket office in Quincy Market, you know, for selling trolley bus tours. And so I thought to myself, it's all about color. I want to see some color around America. And so I, um, after looking around Boston for a bit, I was seeing more color. This was actually the Barking Crab uh, Seaport. And this is the site of the, 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 um, the uh, lobster uh, 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 restaurant that was on the stilts that you saw earlier, if you noticed or if you can remember. Um, and so, I went to Provincetown. Uh, we, I went up to the, the top of the uh, the Cape to work my way back. So we started off in Provincetown and um, it was a different feel up there. Uh, Provincetown is a something I'd never seen before as an Irishman uh, living in, 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 in rural uh, part of the country and uh, also in England, um, where it has a, a different culture. It has a a very open, diverse culture where a lot of people can go. It's also a holiday resort. Um, uh, I was also, uh, how would you say, influenced not only by color, but by this big flag. And I thought, I also think I'm interested in the American flag. So in walking around, I was looking for uh, pictures with flags. And I came across, you know, pictures, the flag was, was standing out uh, by itself. Um, and, uh, and making pictures for me. And, and also the color was very, very interesting. Now this is all done in a day, by the way, this whole trip, we really had about two days down in the Cape or three days. And so um, walking around uh, Provincetown, um, it became clear that it was, it, it was a different type of narrative altogether. The size of those shoes, you know, I don't know how anybody wears them and dances at the same time, but I mean, I just would not see that uh, at home. Um, this big city where the guy's happy sunning himself. Um, I don't know whether they're small people or it's a big chair, um, but it certainly <laughs> looks a bit funny to me. Um, and then we went back to uh, Hyannis, um, where in Hyannis, it's an interesting um, story. When I, when I was making my way across um, town, 
Um, the trolley bus, the reason why I like the trolley bus, the little one at Quincy Market, was because, oh, sorry, I had this picture. I took this picture of the trolley bus back in 1989, and I saw this, um, 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 it's okay to dream a picture, and I loved it. And when I went to um, Hyannis, we went to John F. Kennedy Memorial uh, Museum, and I picked up a postcard, and I went out to see um, the compound uh, out in Hyannis. And so I, I made these pictures here of John F. Kennedy uh, in the area around Hyannis. And the reason why it meant so much to me was because just to go back a little bit in my youth, um, I remember very, very vividly when I was seven years old. And at seven years old, that was 1960, um, living in uh, County Armagh, uh, we were all lined up, all my friends were all lined up uh, in the street and we were all asked, now there's an election going on in America and you all have to vote. And you all have to vote for our guy, who's a guy called John F. Kennedy. He's Irish and he's a Catholic. And so we're all going to vote for him. And so we all voted for uh, John F. Kennedy. It was the first time I ever voted. I was seven years old. I don't know how much of an impact it made, but it got in um, in the end. And three years later, um, um, uh, in the same street, uh, I remember um, vividly running into uh, our house. Uh, my mom was sitting in the corner watching television and uh, she was crying. And I said, what's the matter? And she says, oh, John F. Kennedy's been assassinated. And those two uh, uh, images uh, went, I carried with me all my life. So when I got to uh, the compound in uh, Hyannis, it was quite it was quite something. You could feel that atmosphere going. And so it was a little different. I'd left behind the black and white era, left behind the... Um, the, uh, the archives from 30 years ago, and we saw something uh, different uh, in our travels. And so just to, uh, that, 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 that's more or less the end of the talk to bring it back to what happened with the archives. They ended up in two books, but maybe there's the beginning of another one. Who knows? So that's That was hopefully... great. Martin, that was wonderful. I, I really enjoyed it very much. Ah. Thank you. Yeah, that, it's so fun to go to the color from from. The... It, 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 it's totally different, you know. You go out from a world that is, uh, how would you say, fueled by a, a backdrop of conflict, a world that's fueled by a backdrop of um, uh, uh, rupture, uh, you know, economic and socially and politically, and right into a world of almost total pleasantry and, and, and color. And um, yeah, I, I mean, I noticed it right away. And uh, I was so glad to, be, to have been there and to have experienced, you know, the, uh, the difference because the communities change, you know, city centers don't really change. You know, it, even 30 years later, or hundred years later, you'll go back to Boston, you'll still see the same city center. But if you go into the areas, it'll be a different community. It'll be a different atmosphere. Um, and that evolves all the time because it's the people that are making it. And that's what I noticed about, you know, the Cape Cod thing as well. New communities were evolving and making new types of narratives. And um, yeah, I really enjoyed it. I'm so glad you came to visit us. Yeah. Um, uh, and and the black and white photographs of Belfast were just really fascinating for me to see. I mean, I, I don't know a lot about the troubles, but uh, I certainly help people research it and find books about it. And um, what a tough time, you know, and you captured it so eloquently, so well, I thought, with some of those those images. Yeah, I mean, I was shooting, don't get the wrong impression, I was shooting color while I was making, you know, while I was working, uh, we were shooting color for Time Magazine and Newsweek, they wouldn't take black and white. And even for the, the photojournalism and the, um, and the events, it was all color uh, right through the 80s. But to explain, the, the black and white uh, era uh, that was came out of the American movement um, and, and a little bit of the French movement as well with Cartier-Bresson and some of the British, but they, they were the main people, the Americans, the French and the British. Um, to explain it in black and white terms had more punch. Uh, the colour took away from a little bit of the, 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 the 
the, the dreary kind of uh, washed out images that you would get from the, the kind of uh, hopelessness that went with uh, conflict. And so therefore it was a better medium to work in. Um, but it, it stopped there, I think, in 1989. The message was uh, told, uh, it, it got out there. And I don't really, I, I still use black and white, but more to its artistic advantage. Yeah, uh, it, yeah. To, it expressed the mood you know, and the, the tone of the time very, very well. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. That's great. Thank you so much for all of that. So um, now to the questions. Um, and let's see what we have. And by the way, anyone can unmute themselves to ask a question or send them to the chat. And there, there are a couple here, uh, Martin. So Mary's asking, um, has Martin seen the Boston Irish Famine Memorial at the corner of school in Washington Street in the city? Unveiled in 1998, visited by two Irish presidents and many dignitaries. I did actually. Uh, I was. I actually did come across it on my little trip um, through the city centre um, in September, and um, it's quite impressive, very nice, and it um, um, cements and reinforces uh, the Irish connections um, uh, with Boston. And what was also interesting when I, I went down to uh, Situate and um, is it Cohas uh, Cohas 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 uh -huh. Cohasset, yeah, what the name is, how to pronounce it? Yeah, yeah Cohasset. Um, they're also hoping to develop an Irish trail down around the South Coast as well. Um, and I thought that was interesting that the um, the Irish connection uh, hasn't diluted over the years, that it's still there and uh, people are still interested in um, the connections uh, across the pond. Um, as we say. So mm -hmm. yeah, I did see that memorial, yeah, yeah. And I also was very impressed with the um, the Plymouth uh, ship as well, mm -hmm. uh, down the south coast. There's quite a, f a few um, areas there um, that, um, uh, you know, stretch back into um, uh, connections, both yeah. not only with Ireland, but with the uh, 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 UK as well. Yeah, in the beginning of our country here. Um... Mary, does that answer your question? If you, if anybody has any more, just um, uh, unmute yourself and, and ask Martin. Um, yes, that, it does. Thank you, Jane. That answers my question. Okay, very good. Uh, so, and also, I, I might just say here in Milton, we have a very strong Irish um, community and interest in all things Irish. So, um, it's it's been a great place for me to work and enjoy um, and learn more. About, for example, I, I had a, a program on the Irish family, I believe, and I learned so much from that. So then a next question from Olga. Have you not been afraid to being shot in Belfast? And that's actually a question that I, I had for you, too. Um, you know, how did the troubles and the violence affect your own family and um, safety? Well, um that that's a, a strong question um when i was uh, before i became a member of the uh, the media uh, in 1977 yeah i was very nervous um i even went to um uh, the Sinn Féin office and introduced myself to um a mr adams and uh, some of his uh, uh, cohorts and and told them what i was doing and uh, they were they were very interested. Said, "Listen, we love what you're doing. You know this documentary work, but we can't protect you. Um, what we can do is we can give you some names on a piece of paper that maybe you don't know them. But um, if anyone stops you, just show them the paper, and um, hopefully um, they, they, they'll make the connection um, that you've been to see us because at least you've come and introduced yourself." Um, and so. Um, that was uh, one way of getting around, um, uh, you know, my uh, lack of, uh, in, well, my insecurities, let's put it that way. Um, but when I became um, um, a member of the press and we got very, very close, especially in the early 80s, very close um, to the Republican movement and some of the other movements and the authorities as a bona fide uh, photo agency that was well positioned to represent the, the national newspapers um, and um, also uh, uh, the international newspapers, we kind of had a, a fair bit of protection because um, nearly all the, um, the people who, well, carried guns, they came into our office 
uh, to uh, meet us and to uh, see who we were. And um, uh, in many ways, it would have been very a uh, very unfortunate um, uh, incident if we um, had been hurt. Now, I know that there has been since then um, accidents that have happened, but uh, to be targeted, I think we removed that threat um, by becoming, um, how would you say, very well established and very well known, and also an award-winning um, uh, photo agency. So that helped. Mm -hmm. So both sides were glad to have you uh, representing. Both sides, both sides facts, pretty much yeah. useless, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, very good. And did you have any, did you lose any family members during the troubles or anything like that? Well, um, or friends you grew up with or? The, there is a picture um, I took it out of this um, um, I took it out of this uh, particular uh, talk um, a picture of the um, the people who were in the agency um, there were four of us um, you know who were uh, started off to make the agency and in fact I'm the only one alive so maybe I should have included it but um, yeah I mean they died young uh, either through stress or cancer, uh, but none of them, I don't think, uh, uh, were the subject of any violent deaths mm -hmm. that I know of. Um, but as regards my family, uh, I lived outside of Belfast, and um, um, I used the um, in a, in, a, in a, a fairly safe area. There were no real safe areas, but um, it was relatively uh, uh, safe, and so I was able to go home at night. Um, uh, to have a, a, a fairly normal evening and then go to the war zones in the morning. But that is pretty usual, even in areas of conflict. Even in Ukraine today, you would still manage to have a, a, a semblance of a, a regular life, uh, a destructive uh, or a destructed uh, uh, life, but you would still have to go and look for the war. You know, you mm -hmm. still have to go and look for the front lines mm -hmm. uh, in that respect. I mean, a little um, more severe, of course, you know, but um, yeah. Um, so did, that, that, did that, that, you that's see the film Belfast? S sorry? Did you view the film Belfast? Yes, I did actually. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I watched what, did it you, on, what did you think? What did you think? I, I watched it on the way over to uh, Boston for the talk and uh, on the airplane. And um, I thought it was quite, I thought it was quite interesting. Um, uh, uh, the idea that there were, um, people at that time, myself, one of them, um, who went to England to um, uh, try and escape from the troubles. But it would be more about Belfast people because they were at the core of it. I actually did go to London to uh, get a, a little bit away, but then as a career calling, I thought I wanted to go back and become part of the uh, documentation of it. Um, and again, I am... Um, um, I, I wasn't really brought up with any kind of uh, strong uh, nationalist or unionist uh, sentiments. So um, I, it was easy for me to take a kind of a neutral role or, 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 or a mid-central role uh, in um, working with different groups. Uh, and that's what made us uh, uh, appealing to the different, um, are, uh, different areas and the different groups of people involved in the Belfast um, uh, mm -hmm. conflict that more or less we could be trusted and we weren't really um, that how you say deeply involved in any of the um, one side or the other yeah you weren't taking sides yeah fascinating you did an incredible job of, of representing that I think so then Mary also um, said there's a newly opened South Shore Trail tracing Irish and America from Situate to the Cape which I think you had mentioned well I do know about it because um, I met the people who are trying to organize it. And um, yeah, and they want to um, 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 promote it. They're working actually with Cork, I think, um, as, a, as a sister uh, city. Um, but in, in, in looking at their brochures, um, yeah, it looks like it could be a very, very interesting uh, uh, development over the years, over the coming uh, months and the coming years, yeah. Oh, yeah, I'm going to have to check that out. Okay, and then um, Anne says, I totally enjoyed this presentation. Awesome photos of both Belfast and Boston. Love the photos from your 2022 visit. Thank you so much. 
And exactly. Olga yeah. says, what we lost with time is children playing freely on the street. Sorry, say again, uh, Jean, what, what we lost um, what, what we lost with time is children playing freely on the street. Yeah. yeah in other words, yeah, it's, it's not safe like it used to be in certain parts of the world for children to be yeah. playing on the street, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I think even today, even in, as I said, it's, I think it's a new world really all around. And, um, you know, the idea, when I grew up, I mean, we all played on the street and, um, you know, whether it be rounders or cricket or punching each other or hide and seek. And um, today, you know, it's it, it, it's such a, uh, how do you say, protective world for children. You have to take everything into consideration. And there's reasons for that. And maybe there's a reasons for um, overreacting. I don't know. Um, but I certainly know that um, I don't see, as you say, where I live, uh, children playing on the street the way they used to. I mean, not picture of the children playing on the barricades. I mean, that was very common. You know, that was the way they passed their time. Mm -hmm. And um, in, in many ways, you were told, get out into the street and play and meet your friends, because in some ways, grouping together in, in, in numbers was also part of the safety. You know, mm -hmm. if you have a group of children of 10 or 12 or 20, you've got a lot of witnesses there. And um, yeah. you know, it doesn't take a, a a lot of screaming, you know, from children to draw attention. And and mm -hmm. and yeah, yeah. So I don't know. I don't know what to say about that one. But it, it is but that's something. That's a good point. Yeah. Yeah. Well, when I grew up in the country uh, in New England, but we always walked to school, a long way to school. We rode our bikes all over. I always felt safe. I didn't. I don't know. Oh, I guess we were lucky. That was another time. So mm. let's see here. Um, Ian is saying, thank you very much. Interesting, very interesting talk. Enjoyed it very much. And um, Craig says, love the black and white photos as they make a very strong statement of the time period. And Mary says, in the mid seventies, living in the South of Ireland, our family were part of a program where young children from the North of Ireland could come for a few weeks together to get away from the troubles. That's pretty yeah. interesting. Yeah, yeah. That's great. Thank you, everyone, for being here. And Martin, that was an incredible presentation. And best of luck with your books. Okay, um, thank you. I'm going to let all my colleagues know about them. And, right. um, does anybody okay, else have any other uh, questions? It's lovely. I, I always find I enjoy these um, um, uh, talks. You know, you, you kind of think a little, ner you're a little nervous beforehand. But, you know, once you get into it, then you realize that you're, 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 you're just talking in a, to you know nice people who are sitting around um, and 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 are interested in what you're doing and you know I find that very very comforting and um, it also uh, it's nice to be able to show people the pictures of the people who helped to make you know the archive uh, because you know I do get a lot of um, uh, people from research institutions from um, like for instance the National Portrait Gallery in London the Tate Gallery. The, um, uh, as I told you, the Library of Congress in the United States, the Boston Library, they all wanted uh, to use the books for reference. And mm -hmm. they can use that for reference for a lot of things, whether it be what the streets looked like or what the clothes they were wearing, or, um, you know, especially the Belfast one, where not many people had the privilege of being able to move around freely, um, you know, uh, crossing the, 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 the peace lines and the, the barricades as I had with the idea of making a long-term documentary project. And that was uh, that's the difference between the photojournalists who marry into documentary photography and maybe just people who are interested in making a documentary over a period of time, but they don't have those, um, um, how you say, uh, drawbacks. Um, mm. of, oh, um, yeah, the limitations. Of, of that yeah. 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 So... I'm, I mean, that, 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 that's another nice part of uh, having the talks that you can explain all that. So, yeah. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. It's a, it's a wonderful education for the next generation, too, who don't know very much about this. So thank you again. And thanks, everybody, for being here. And I guess um, I'll see you next time. Bye. Okay. Pleasure to bye. meet you, Martin. Okay. You too. Bye. Okay. Bye-bye.